Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Cabot Science Library, I am very excited to welcome you to our program tonight with Naomi Oreskes, discussing her latest book, Why Trust Science. In just a moment, I will turn things over to History of Science professor Janet Brown, who will be introducing the program. But first, I would just like to say a few words about this series and how you can learn more about our upcoming spring season. Uh, this Science Book Talk series features talks throughout the academic year by the authors of recently published science-related literature. Tonight, our fall season is coming to a close, having featured some really wonderful talks these last few weeks by Sean Carroll, Lee Smolin, Randall Monroe, and many, many others. If you'd like to stay connected to the series over the holidays, I do have a few options for you. Nearly all of our talks are filmed and recorded for the public. You can access them at the web address that I've written on the board right over there. Um, you can also find on this website announcements about our spring events lineup. And lastly, you can learn about Harvard Bookstore's other book talks, which take place in and around Harvard Square, by visiting us at harvard.com and signing up for our weekly email newsletter. Tonight's talk is going to be followed by some time for your questions, after which we'll have a book signing and refreshments in the Cabot Science Library just across the hall. And if you haven't picked one up already, we'll have copies of Why Trust Science for sale in the back of the hall and in the library as well. Uh, and as always, just a few thank yous. Thank you to our partners here at Harvard who make this series and the very important array of cheeses at the reception possible. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for being here, for purchasing books that support independent business, and for affirming that science matters. And finally, just a reminder to silence your cell phones before the talk begins. So now I'm excited to introduce Janet Brown. Award-winning author, Charles Darwin scholar, and Aramont professor of the history of science here at Harvard. The New York Times calls her renowned two-volume biography of Darwin matchless in detail and compass. She's been editor of the British Journal for the History of Science and currently serves as president of the History of Science Society. We are very happy to have her here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Professor Brown. Thank you, Kate. That was very sweet of you. I wasn't expecting an intro for me. <laughs> I, uh, my um, brief tonight is to say hello. Thank you very much for coming and to introduce Naomi Oreskes, Professor Oreskes, to you. Um, Naomi joined Harvard in 2013 and is a professor in the History of Science department with an affiliation to Earth and Planetary Sciences. And she's had that kind of dual career for many years now. Previously, she was at the University of California, San Diego, in the Science Studies program. And I hesitate to make that parallel to history of science here, but it's very similar in its scope and range. Science Studies program at San Diego, and also affiliated with the geology department there, and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. So that this her life has consistently been shared between science and science studies and history. She had an early career as a geologist, a, a real scientist, in <laughs> Australia, <laughs> in other places. And if you have the good fortune to um, go to her office in the History Science Department upstairs here, you will find um, the trophies of that career as a geologist. She has a magnificent rock collection in her study. She turned to analyzing science and science policy, particularly the environment, environmental policy, and uh, has now become very famous for her views on climate change. And underneath it all has been a strong commitment to helping people recognize that we as the members of the public, we as scientists trust need to trust scientific findings. She's become one of the most compelling voices in the um, disclosure of current environmental degradation, and she's become a very um, prominent political voice in uh, exposing the individuals 
and the policies behind the individuals who deny climate change. And one of the things that she's been very engaged in showing is that we commonly refer to the climate change debate. And Naomi has gone to a lot of trouble, a great deal of detail, a number of books and articles, uh, stressing that there isn't really a debate. Scientists all believe it's happening. It's not a debate. And that the debate has been falsely manufactured by many individuals who she describes in a book that brought her into the limelight called Merchants of Doubt. But I just want to mention that all of this began with a paper she published in Science in 2004, which was about the scientific consensus on climate change. And that caused a giant stir at the time and shows that the results that the scientists had put forward by 2004, and obviously since then too, are completely trustworthy, that there isn't a debate, so to speak. And these did lead to her book with Eric Conway called Merchants of Doubt, which was published in 2010. There's a new edition out next year, and it has, in the interval, been made into a documentary film that I do recommend if you get a chance to catch that. It's both striking and very worrisome indeed. The same cooperation with Eric Conway has led to a super book, which I see is actually for sale at the table up at the top. Um, it's a fiction, Penguin, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a paperback book for the Brits. Penguin is synonymous with paperback, <laughs> um, called The Collapse of Western Civilization, A View from the Future, in which she and her co-author imagined they are living in the year 2393, looking back at the year 2000, and s noting who and when and how and where all the irreversible changes took place that then in this future year, many years hence, was destroying the world. So I do recommend that. Um, it's not a fun read, but it, <laughs> it, it is fiction and um, is very illuminating. She's working on a new book at the moment on oceanography during the Cold War, but we're here tonight to hear her speak about her most recent book, Why Trust Science? which I'm sure she will tell us, is based on some public lectures she gave and brings together many of the important um, commitments that she has towards making sure that people understand that science is completely trustworthy. Um, you may not know, but there are people out there who think it's not trustworthy. So it's an important book. I do hope you get a chance to read it, buy it and read it, but also she's going to speak about it tonight There'll be some time for questions afterwards. So here you are, Naomi. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Janet, for that kind introduction. Can everyone hear me? OK. Well, as a short woman, I don't like podia, which are designed for big men and make me look like a talking head. So I'm going to talk from up here. And I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight. I'm not going to do my usual thing with 100 slides crammed with data and facts and empirical information. I want to talk a little bit tonight about why I wrote this book, why I think it's an important book, why I took the time to write it, um, and then do some readings from a few sections in the book. So as Janet said, and by the way, thank you to the Harvard Bookstore. Thank you to Melissa Franklin also for making this possible. And thank you all for being here tonight. So as, as Janet said, I'm the co-author with Eric Conway of the book Merchants of Doubt. That book was published in 2010, and it asked the question, who are the people who deny climate change? And why would educated people, because many of them are highly educated, why would educated people reject hard-won scientific findings? And in that book, we showed how much of the opposition to climate change was ideologically motivated. It was not based on ignorance. It was not based on a lack of public understanding of science. It could not be explained by a deficit model, but that actually these were highly educated people who were ideologically motivated to challenge climate science and also the science related to many other environmental issues and also public health issues 
because they were ideologically committed to free market capitalism, to the principles of laissez-faire economics, and the fear that government intervention in the marketplace would put us on a slippery slope to socialism. So it was tied up with Cold War politics. It was tied up with the American weapons programs. Many of these people were physicists who had worked on uh, Cold War weapons programs, the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, the early space program. And so when the book came out, and actually even before it came out, I gave a lot of public lectures. I got tremendous numbers of invitations to speak in public. And in these public lectures, I focused on the development of the science of climate change. And as a historian of science, I told the story of how scientists had come to understand this problem, why they started even studying it at all. Why did Dave Keeling in 1958 decide to dedicate his life to measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Why did a whole group of scientists, starting with Suki Minabe and Kirk Bryan, why did these people decide that building models of the Earth's climate system was an important thing to do scientifically? And so I would give these very cra carefully crafted talks of which the meta message was, this is not a fad. This is not just the latest liberal environmental fad like eating kale or something. Uh, this is something that scientists have been working on for more than 100 years. Uh, actually, more than 150 years. It goes back to the discovery of carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas uh, by... Um, John Tyndall in Ireland in the 1840s. And so if this was a hoax, it had to have started in Ireland, not in China. Um, so the point was to give people an understanding of the depth of the science in order then to be able to say that the opposition to this is not scientific. And so I gave these talks all over the country. I went every, pretty much every place I was invited. I developed what I called my red state pledge to make sure that if I was invited someplace where people might be not obviously sympathetic that I would make the effort to talk to those folks. And one of the best things about giving public talks is that people ask interesting questions. And you learn from your audience. And you learn about what are they concerned about? How do they view this issue? And um, so I'm happy to say that I, unlike some people, I have not lived for the last 10 years in the Cambridge bubble. And, Sometimes there's, some, there's like an incident where someone asks a question that really sticks in your mind. So I gave a talk in Hayes, Kansas. And if you don't know where it is, you should look it up on your Google Maps. And um, it, was a great, it was a great experience. During the bookstore, uh, during the book signing afterwards, there was a woman who came up to me. She took my arm and she said to me, God bless you for coming to Hayes. <laughs> so it was a great visit. I had a terrific time there. But I also remember really clearly one question I got. So after the talk, a man in the audience stood up, put his hands on his hips like this, puffed up his chest, and said, well, that's all very well and good, but why should we trust the science? And in different versions, in different forms, some less aggressive, some more, I got that question a lot. That, and what I came to realize from these questions was that I, probably like most of you here today, probably like almost anyone who teaches at Harvard goes to Harvard, and most people who live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we take it for granted that science is broadly trustworthy. It doesn't mean that we necessarily accept everything that scientists say. And we may be mindful of the fact that sometimes scientists do change their minds about things. But we don't generally question the basic enterprise. We take it for granted, by and large, with some exceptions, that if scientists, real scientists, serious scientists, our own colleagues, in the Earth and Planetary Science Department or the School of Public Health, if they tell us that they've studied this thing, and yes, we know that the climate is changing and that change is being driven by greenhouse gases and deforestation, or yes, we know that eating a lot of red meat is not good for your health, or yes, we know that vaccinations don't cause autism, most of us, probably in most cases, will say, yeah, fine. And we won't really be motivated to challenge that. But there are a lot of people outside 0213A, who don't view it that way. And so I started thinking that it was important to address this question, that this was actually a non-trivial question. And you know, I, I have the good fortune that I periodically stumble on questions that 
somehow become incredibly timely. So I started writing this book for the president of the occupant of the White House had been elected. My husband likes to say a broken clock is right twice a day, so don't let it go to your head. Um, but everybody keeps telling me how incredibly timely this book is, which I find actually a little ironic because I've been thinking about it for probably the better part of almost 10 years. But when I was invited a few years ago to give the Tanner Lectures in Princeton, at Princeton, Tanner Lectures in Human Values, this seemed like the right time to, to address this. And so the book is based on those lectures, um, and it includes the comments of other scholars who were invited to the event who then commented on my lectures. And then afterwards, I revised the lectures in part in response to those comments. And they revised their comments in part in response to my response to them. And then I got to write an epilogue. So there was a very, uh, very rich exchange between me and the other commentators who have written in the book. And I think this turned out to be a really great thing that we did. I didn't really think about it beforehand, because in a way, we modeled the central argument of the book. So I thought I'll talk for a few minutes now about what that central argument is, then mention some of the issues that the commentators read, raised, and then I'll read a few portions of the book that respond to the commentators' concerns. So the central argument of the book is that the basis for the trustworthiness of science is not what many of us think. And by that I mean it's not the scientific method. Many of us were raised to believe that science is trustworthy, that scientists get reliable results by virtue of using the scientific method. And if you have children in high school and if they have a high school science textbook, I can almost guarantee you that you will be very likely to find this. I know it's what I was taught in school. I know it's what my children were taught in school. But it's always troubled me because I'm a geologist at heart, by training. I did always wear my cowboy boots for talks, so you know I'm a geologist. Um, <laughs> it's not what geologists do. That is to say, the thing that is generally presented as the scientific method. So if I were to say to you, what is the scientific method, what would you say? Anybody? Yeah, do an experiment. Have a hypothesis. Do an experiment to test the hypothesis. And if this experiment succeeds, then you say the hypothesis is correct. If the experiment fails, then you go back and revise and try to think of something else. But as a geologist, I never did an experiment, ever. I mean, there are experimental geologists. There are people who do. But I never did an experiment. Everything I did was empirical, inductive. Um, and of course, we just heard an introduction by the world's preeminent scholar of Charles Darwin, who also was largely an inductive and observational science. And we know that a huge amount of science, a huge amount of important science uh, in what we could call the natural historical sciences, geology, biology, ecology, but also cosmology. Um, a tremendous amount of it is observational, empirical, and inductive, and it's not based on experiments. And even if we think about experiments nowadays, many scientists don't do experiments with test tubes. They don't wear white lab coats. They do experiments on computers. Some people now even talk about things being done in silico, which I find very pretentious, but OK, whatever. Um, you know, the point is numerical simulation modeling has become an important tool in science as well. So what we see in the history of science, what I knew and learned from my own experience as a geologist and what my colleagues in history of science have amply demonstrated over and over and over again is that there isn't one singular scientific method. There are many methods. The methods have evolved and changed over time. We didn't have computer modeling in the 19th century, but we did have physical modeling. In the early 20th century, we had electromechanical models. So there have been different kinds of models. I've studied geologists who made models out of plaster and clay and glycerin and other fun stuff. Um, so the methods of science are diverse. And I think most historians of science would say that's a good thing, that there's diversity, strength and diversity. But if the methods of science are diverse, then it cannot be the case that the grounds for trust in science is the scientific method, since there isn't one singular scientific method. So in that case, what is it? And so in the book, I argue that it's much less about how claims are generated and much more about how claims are evaluated. And I argue that the really key thing about science is the collective vetting of claims. That when I do an experiment or make observations, develop a claim, that's in a way just the beginning of the process, because now I have to subject that claim to critical scrutiny. And I do that in many different ways. Peer review, formal peer review in journals, is the thing that 
is most obvious, the one that we can identify, but there's also a whole process of informal peer review that occurs before most of us ever even submit our articles for publication. So if you're a scientist, you know this, right? You know that you shop your ideas around in workshops, at conferences. Maybe you send articles to some colleagues who you trust and get their feedback before you submit it. Maybe you show it to your grad students or your postdocs. There's a whole process of vetting and revising and fixing in the sense of revising and resubmitting before we even submit. And then we submit to a journal for publication, and then we go through another round of formal peer review. And as all of you know, if you've done this, peer review can be pretty nasty. It's often not very nice, <laughs> but we take it. Like, why do we go through? Why do we put up with it? As I was finishing this book, my husband was going through a particularly nasty round of peer review at a journal whose name will not be mentioned. And I remember thinking, so why do we go through this? Why do we put up with it? And of course, we put up with it because we believe in our hearts, even if we don't always like it, that it's good for us, and kind of like medicine, right? That the process will lead to a better product in the end, that the reviewers will raise legitimate issues, they will make us sometimes think harder about some claim we've made. Maybe they'll actually force us to collect more data. And that's a good thing. Because it means when papers are published, they've been vetted to a pretty significant degree. Now, we all know that peer review is imperfect. We all know that sometimes crappy, stupid, inane, and otherwise bad papers get published. When I was in graduate school, I once read a paper. It was describing some veins of minerals or deposits that were cutting through a rock. And the radiometric dating of these veins showed the veins to be older than the rocks that they were cutting through. Now, this is not physically possible. And I remember sitting there reading this thinking, how did this paper get through peer review? <laughs> right, so we know that peer review is an imperfect process. But nevertheless, we still believe, by and large, that it does a lot of good. And then once the paper is published, there's still more review. Because then you have the opportunity to write a criticism, a discussion, a reply. And of course, then there's the proof of the pudding, which is if a paper is bad or wrong or stupid, it doesn't really get used, right? We cite and use work that we think helps us. And so the work that gets cited, the work that gets used, the work that becomes the foundations of new ideas, there's a process involved in that as well. And we all know that the vast majority of papers that are published are never actually cited at all. A little bit of a depressing thought, but not, not any of our papers, of course. Um, but so there's this process. So over time, there's a kind of winnowing effect where the papers that have stood the test of time stand the test of time. And so my argument is that it's that process, this critical vetting of claims, that is actually the thing that yields reliable results because the unreliable results or the incredible results by and large, get winnowed out. Now, again, this is a kind of statistical and probabilistic view. I'm not saying that every paper that's published is good or that every bad paper gets rejected. Obviously not. But it's an argument about sort of overall. Now, an important caveat to this, of course, though, is that scientists can have blind spots. We know, and again, the history of science has shown this over and over and over again, that scientists can be biased. Scientists can be a bit tone deaf, to change metaphors, to issues of race or gender. And we certainly know there's enormous amount of work from the 19th century in which we can look now and identify obvious gender bias or obvious racial bias. So this leads to one more important thing. For this process to work effectively, the scientific community has to be diverse. Because the more diverse it is, the more different perspectives that are brought to bear the greater the likelihood that someone in that community can identify a blind spot, call out a bias, and have the opportunity to correct it. And so what this vision of science tells us is that diversity is not just um, the right thing to do ethically. It's actually the right thing epistemologically as well. So I think that's a pretty important conclusion. OK, the other part of the book, the one other argument is that when scientists do all this work, when they submit papers for publication, make claims, what is that based on? It's based on work. It's based on all these different methods that I've already said scientists use. And so the other key part of this is that scientists are critically engaged in a sustained way with the natural world, or if it's social science, with the social world. And so the book is in some ways a defense of expertise. 
So it's very trendy right now to be critical of experts, to be skeptical, to say experts are always getting it wrong. But in fact, I'm not sure that that's actually true. And this is another thing that came out of some talks. Sometimes people would say to me, well, why should we be, get, be believe experts when they're always getting it wrong? And then I would ask my interlocutor, well, what exactly is it that, you know, what's, what example of scientists getting it wrong are you thinking of? And interestingly enough, very often the people would have no example. It was just sort of a general impression they had that we all know that scientists get it wrong all the time. But when they did have examples, they were always from nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taking a greater interest in nutrition these days, been closely following this recent debate about red meat. Um, I think we can identify some reasons why nutrition is the dismal science. Um, and there is a merchants of doubt story going on right now with respect to the meat industry and red meat. So um, we need to acknowledge those things, but that's not the topic of this book. But what is the topic of this book is a, is a defense of expertise. And in a sense, what I argue is that we often talk about science as something very different and very exalted, uh, something that's hard to understand, something that's very arcane. But I want to argue that a better way to think about it is that actually scientists are no different than plumbers or electricians or car mechanics or tax accountants in the sense that they are our experts in a designated area. For a plumber, that area is plumbing. For a car mechanic, it's car mechanics. And for scientists, it's the natural world. And we trust our car mechanic to fix our car, by and large, if we have a decent mechanic, because we actually don't know how to fix our cars ourselves. We need our car mechanics, just as we need our dentists, because we can't fix our own teeth. And we need our doctors, and we need our tax accountants. In fact, we need experts of all kinds. The modern world depends upon expertise. If we didn't trust experts, society would come to a standstill. We wouldn't be able to get to work in the morning if we didn't trust experts. We wouldn't be able to maintain our health. Or even if we are into sports and we read the sports pages and analysts make it more interesting or tell us something about we should be looking out for in a game. So we're relying on experts all the time. And we rarely ask the question, well, why do we trust our dentists? And yet somehow we do ask this question about why we should trust scientists. So my argument is that scientists are our experts. They are the people that we pay, that we employ, and that we trust to do the work of understanding the natural world, work that we ourselves are, in most cases, not able or qualified to do. So that's the argument of the book. So I thought what I would do now is just mention three of the issues that the commentators raised, and then um, read a bit from the book in, of my response to that. And that way, hopefully, you'll still be interested to meet, read the main part of the book, because I won't have given it all away. So, OK. So there were three uh, big issues that got raised by the commentators. One had to do with the problem of circularity. So I'm saying that scientific claims are trustworthy because they're vetted by other scientific experts. But of course, if experts are judging experts, then you could argue that that's a circular argument. Because how do we know if the experts are right? And how do we even know who the experts are? So I'm going to read a little section that speaks to that issue. The second issue that was raised in the book by Professor John Krosnick, Mark Lang raised the first issue about circularity, um, the issue of the replication crisis. So almost all of us have heard about the replication crisis. We know, or do we know? We think we know that this is a big issue in science. So I'm going to have a few words to say about that. And then the third issue that got raised was the role of values in science, and especially the problem that we all know that scientists can be overconfident, and that overconfidence in scientific claims can sometimes not be a great idea. And we also know, again, from the history of science, that scientists themselves are not always deeply self-aware about how their own values can influence their scientific thinking. Um, so I have a few things to say about that as well. So with that, I will read a little bit from the book. Mark Lang suggests that the question of why we should trust science can, quote, easily induce a kind of dizziness or even despair. Many potential answers collapse into circularity. For example, reasoning that invokes empirical evidence, such as my argument based on history, is itself a form of scientific argument, insofar as it's empirical. 
in which case we are using scientific styles of reasoning to defend scientific styles of reasoning, the very definition of circularity. Moreover, if I say we should trust science as the warranted conclusion of experts, then we must ask on what basis is someone judged to be an expert? The answer, of course, is by other experts. So that is circular too. Or is it? The signs of expertise, academic credentials, publications on the pertinent topics in peer-reviewed journals, awards and prizes are evident to non-experts. Journalists have sometimes asked me, how am I to tell if an alleged expert really is one and not just a shill? I reply, one place to start is to find out what field they trained in and what publications they have in that domain. Of course, Professor Lang is right to note that training is provided by other experts. It takes an expert to make an expert. And so it may appear that we have not escaped circularity. But there is an escape, because the social markers of expertise are evident to non-experts. This is a non-trivial point, because it is relatively easy to discern that most climate change deniers are not climate scientists, and that objections to evolutionary theory largely emerge from non-scientific domains. Neutral non-experts can identify experts, and we can discern what they have or have not concluded. Social markers do not tell us if an expert is trustworthy, but they do tell us if the person is an expert, and more to the point, if a person claiming expertise does not possess it. Similarly, it should be, it is or it should be easy to distinguish a research institution, like Princeton University or the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, from policy-driven think tanks, such as the American Enterprise or Discovery Institutes. The fact that journalists often fail to make su such distinctions has more to do with deadlines than with epistemology. Of course, as I have stressed, experts can be wrong. Our entire inquiry would be superfluous were this not the case. As a human activity, science is fallible. Consensus is not the same as truth. Consensus is a social condition, not an epistemic one. But we use consensus as a proxy because we have no way to know for sure what the truth is. Moreover, the category of consensus is epistemology, epistemologically pertinent because our historical cases have shown that where experts appear to have gone astray, typically there was a lack of consensus. Thus, we need to live with the fact that our indicators are asymmetric. We can never be absolutely positively sure that we are right, but we do have indicators that suggest when something might be wrong. And this is why consensus is important, why it is so important to be able to identify and discount shills, celebrities, and perhaps well-meaning but misguided lay people in order to clarify who is an expert, what they have to say, and on what basis they are saying it. OK, so that deals with the circularity problem and the definition of experts. Now I'm going to read a little bit about the replication crisis. And obviously, these are just short excerpts of longer, more complicated conversations. Professor John Krosnick calls attention to a serious issue in contemporary science, the, quote, replication crisis. It is an issue with potential to undermine public trust in science, as well as to refute my argument that the communal processes of vetting scientific claims are likely to lead to reliable results, so long as the vetters are diverse and open to self-criticism. The issue is this. There have been a number of well-publicized examples of papers published in reputable journals, and in some cases heavily cited, whose results could not be replicated. Some papers have been retracted, leading commentators to declare a retraction crisis as well. Much of the discussion of the replication crisis, as well as, as well as of potential remedies, has focused specifically on psychology and biomedicine. However, Professor Krosnick claims that the problems pertain to all contemporary science because of the incentive structure that rewards rapid publication at the expense of care and diligence. This may be, but Krosnick's specific examples are all from psychology and biomedicine, and the latter predominantly from clinical trials of drugs. Both are domains in which statistical analysis plays a central role, and both are areas in which the misuse of statistics, particularly p-hacking, has been demonstrated. It seems reasonable to conclude that the misuse of science of statistics is not restricted to psychology and biomedicine. But is there a broader problem with science writ large? 
Here the evidence becomes more ambiguous. And I find it surprising that Professor Krosnick, who stresses the importance of rigorous empirical research, makes broad claims on limited evidence and lumps together phenomena that may be distinct. So here I'm being a little hard on John Krosnick, but I think he asked for it. <laughs> In his opening, he offers a story of outright fraud, a professor who had fabricated data in over 100 publications and leading journals. No doubt this is bad stuff, but fraud is a feature of all human activity. Is it more common in science than in finance or real estate or mineral prospecting? The information offered here does not enable us to judge. What it does enable us to do is to ask why this fraud was not detected sooner, reminding us that science, like every human activity, demands oversight and to consider whether better oversight mechanisms in science are needed. But then Krosnick offers us something completely different, the story of a paper that claimed to demonstrate the reality of ESP and, quote, set off a firestorm because the results seemed implausible and could not be reproduced. This is the opposite of fraud. It illustrates science working as it should. A paper was published that made a strong, surprising, and implausible claim. Immediately, it received tough critical scrutiny, and the psychology community rejected it. Now, one might query why this paper was published in the first place, but if science is to be open to diverse ideas, as I argue it must be, then it is inevitable that incorrect, stupid, and even absurd items will sometimes make their way into print. By itself, that is not an indictment of science. On the contrary, it is evidence that the scientific community has remained open, even to ideas that some of us might think should be closed down. Then we have the example of one of the most well-known studies in the history of psychology, the famous or infamous Stanford Prison Experiments. Here we are told that the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, which is not a scientific organization, so one has to immediately wonder why about motivations and possible bias, that the BBC tried and failed to replicate the Stanford Prison Experiment. So now we have study one versus study two. What are we to think of that? Four options present themselves. Study one is correct and study two failed to replicate it because of flaws in the latter. Option two, study two is correct and study one should be considered refuted. Option three, both studies are incorrect, albeit in different ways. Option four, both studies are correct, but the conditions under which they were performed were different and therefore they provide different information about the effects of the conditions under which humans behave. Without additional information, it is impossible to determine which of these four options is the right one. Most of the studies that Professor Krosnick offers as evidence of trouble in science are single studies that were later shown to be faulty. But the thrust of my argument is to stress that scientific knowledge is never created by a single study, no matter how famous, important, or well-designed. What leads to reliable scientific knowledge is the process by which claims are vetted. Crucially, that vetting must involve diverse perspectives and the presentation of evidence collected in diverse ways. This means that a single paper cannot be the basis for reliable scientific knowledge. In hindsight, we might conclude that the Stanford Prison Experiment was given far too much weight, considering that it was a single study. Professor Krosnick's commentary thus reinforces my argument about consensus. We should be skeptical of any single paper in science. Scientific discovery is a process, not an event. In that process, many provisional claims, perhaps even most provisional claims, will be shown to be incomplete and sometimes erroneous. As several past presidents of the US National Academy of Sciences recently argued, refutation and retraction, if done in a timely manner, may be viewed as science correcting itself as it should. Conventionally, we have called this process progress. And now I'd like to read finally from a section about the question of values in science. This, I think, is the most tricky and complicated one um, because it is a tricky and complicated question. So bear with me. Some people worry that overconfidence in the findings of science or the views of scientists can lead to bad public policy. I agree. 
overemphasizing technical considerations at the expense of social, moral, or economic ones can lead to bad decisions. But this does not bear on the question of whether the science involved is right or wrong. If a scientific matter is settled, and the scientific community that has settled on it is open and diverse, then it behooves us to accept that science and then decide what, if anything, to do about its implications. This, at least, is what nearly every scientist I know would say. It is something that in the past I have said. It actualizes the classic fact-value distinction, the idea that we can identify facts and then separately decide what to do about them, if anything, based on our values. But as an empirical matter, this strategy is no longer working, if it ever did, because most people do not separate science from its implications. We know now that many people reject climate science not because there is anything wrong with the science, qua science, but because it conflicts or is seen as conflicting with their values, their religious views, their political ideology, or their economic interests. There are many reasons people reject or may be critical of scientific findings, but often involves the perception that these findings contradict their values or threaten their way of life. In the 1960s, many people on the political left criticized science because of its uses in warfare. Today, many on the political right criticize it because of the way it, the way it seems to explode, sorry, the way it seems to expose flaws in contemporary capitalism and the American way of life. For example, in a discussion of anthropogenic climate change prior to the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, U.S. President George H.W. Bush insisted, quote, that the American way of life is not up for negotiation. The president signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the international treaty that emerged from that meeting, and he promised to act upon it. Yet at the same time, he identified a clash between the implications of the findings of environmental science and the highly consumptive American lifestyle. At least some environmentalists were blaming that lifestyle for environmental ills and thus wanting to change it. This pattern persists persist today and helps to explain why Republicans are so much more skeptical of climate science than Democrats. Indeed, it is the only thing that explains why some conservatives insist that proposals to act on climate change are anti-democratic anti-American or anti-freedom. If we ask scientists, why do evangelical Christians reject evolutionary biology, many would answer that it is because they make a literal reading of the Bible, insisting that God created the earth and everything on it in six days. But as Catholic biologist Kenneth Miller has pointed out, evangelical arguments against evolutionary theory rarely involve literal interpretations of the Bible. In fact, they rarely invoke the Bible at all. Rather, they invoke the perceived moral or amoral implications of a theory that says humans arose by chance, the outcome of a non-purposeful random process. Former Pennsylvania senator and two-time presidential candidate Rick Santorum, for example, has explained that he rejects the concept of evolution by natural selection because it makes humans, quote, into mistakes of nature and in doing so obliterates the basis for morality. Other anti-evolutionists argue that if evolution is, life, is true, then life has no meaning. Now, scientists attempt to escape the sting of these extra scientific considerations by retreating into value neutrality, insisting that while our science may have political, social, economic, or moral implications, the science itself is value-free. Therefore, values are not legitimate grounds on which to reject science. Gravity doesn't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. Acid rain falls on both organic farms and golf courses. That was an actual line from Bill Ruckelhaus many years ago. Radiative transfer in the atmosphere functions today just as it did before 2016. This argument is true, but insufficient. Because whether or not they should, or I should say whether or not we should, our audiences do link science to its implications. Evangelical Christians reject evolutionary science because they believe it contradicts their religious views. Evangelical free marketeers reject climate science because it exposes contradictions in their economic worldview. And because of these contradictions, they distrust the scientists responsible for exposing them. This is hard to get around 
particularly when we acknowledge that there is no scientific method that warns the veracity of scientific conclusions and that science is simply the consensus of relevant experts on a matter after due consideration. A view of scientific knowledge as the consensus of experts inevitably brings us to the question of who scientists are and on what basis they should be trusted. Scientists typically consider such questions to be ad hominem and therefore illegitimate. But if we take seriously the conclusion that science is a consensual social process, then it matters who scientists are. It is beyond the scope of this book to consider what social scientists have discovered as to how trust is created and sustained, but one thing we know is that it is easier to establish trust among people with shared values than among those without shared values. Yet values are precisely what scientists by and large decline to discuss. Like the, scientist, like the question of who the scientist is, the question of what scientists believe in, other than science itself, has generally been considered to be off limits. When their objectivity or integrity is questioned, scientists char characteristically retreat, as sociologist Robert Merton noted decades ago, into, quote, the exaltation of pure science, insisting that their only motivation is the pursuit of knowledge. Whatever the implications of scientific findings, they insist that the enterprise itself is value neutral. But no one can be truly value neutral. So when scientists claim that they are, it comes across as false, for they are claiming the impossible. Unless we accept them as idiot savants or naifs, we may come to see them as dishonest. Yet honesty, openness, and transparency are said to be key virtues in scientific research. So how can scientists be honest and at the same time deny that they have values? Scientists generate a contradiction at the root of their enterprise if, while insisting on its honesty, they mislead their audiences, even if unintentionally, about its character. Now, it may be objected that scientists are not claiming that they have no values, but only that they do not allow those values to influence their work. This is a claim that is impossible to prove or disprove, but one that both social science research and common sense suggests is unlikely to be true. And this leads us to a further point, one that has somehow escaped serious consideration, but which may be at the heart of the distrust of science felt by many Americans. To say that science is value neutral is more or less equivalent to saying that it has no values, at least none other than knowledge production, and this can elide into the implication that scientists have no values. Now, clearly this is not the case, but scientists' reluctance to discuss their values can give the impression that their values are problematic and need to be hidden, or perhaps they have no values at all. And would you trust a person who has no values? So, the obvious answer is you would not. Such a person would be a sociopath. Nor would you trust a person whose values you consider to be anathema to your own. But if you thought that that person shared at least some of your values, even if perhaps not all of them, then you might be willing to listen. And you might accept some of what you were hearing. Therefore, whether or not claims of value neutrality are epistemologically defensible, I think it is clear that they do not work in practice, because they do not work to permit communication and build bonds of trust. Now, scientists may sometimes feel that there is simply no way for them to forge bonds of trust with climate change deniers or people who think the world is 6,000 years old, and perhaps that is true. I once despaired publicly, in fact, in this room, in this lecture series organized by Melissa Franklin, I despaired publicly of reaching millenarians whose eschatology tells us that the world is about to end so why worry about climate change? This was actually the final question on a pretty late night where we took questions pretty long. And the final last question was about my relatives in Texas who think the world's going to end, so why should we care about climate change? And I said, that might be hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, the very next day, I received several emails from correspondents offering me strategies to teach them based on Christian values and teachings. And I know a lot now about Corinthians. People suggested that the way to reach people was through their values, and social science research supports that idea. So,
Given this argument, uh, well, let me, let, I want to read one more thing and then I'll go to the end. Historian of, of religion Stephen Prother has noted that while Jews, Catholics, and Protestants all affirm the Ten Commandments, there are surprisingly different versions of them. How many of you know this, that the Ten Commandments are not the same for the Jews, Protestants, and Catholics? Yeah, some people know, but a lot of people don't know this. Um, it actually explained a, a mystery. So it had always been a long time a mystery to me of how it was that you could go to a Catholic church and there'd be all these graven images. I'm like, it's not violating the commandments. Well, it turns out Catholics abandoned the injunction against graven images onto which Jews and Protestants have firmly held. And having thus lost a commandment and finding themselves awkwardly with only nine, they divided the last one into two. Anybody know what that is? Yeah? Right, coveting. It turns out for Catholics, there are two different commandments about coveting. One for coveting your neighbor's wife and one for coveting everything else. So your neighbor's wife is something special. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, these three religions, which encompass about 70% of American adults, agree that we should not kill, steal, commit adultery, or bear false witness or covet your neighbor's wife. They also agree that we should worship only one God, not take his or her name in vain, keep the Sabbath, honor our fathers and mothers. Islam agrees with these things too, although it stresses charity more centrally than the other three do. Zadok, the giving of alms, is one of its five pillars. But note how similar the word zadok is to the Hebrew word tzedakah, charitable giving, which is considered a moral obligation in Jewish life. Charity is also a central Christian value as well and observant Mormons tithe. So even as we disagree about many political issues, our core values may overlap to a considerable degree. And to the extent that we can make clear those areas of agreement and explain how they relate to our scientific work, we might be able to overcome the feelings of skepticism and distrust that often prevail, particularly distrust that is rooted in a perception of the clash of values. So I think it's only fair and right that I should be clear about my values and what motivates me to do the work that I have done defending climate science. I wish to prevent avoidable human suffering and to protect the beauty and diversity of life on Earth. I wish to preserve the joy of winter sports, the majesty of coral reefs, and the wonder of the giant sequoia trees. I love thunderstorms, but I do not want them to become more dangerous. I do not want flooding and hailstorms and hurricanes to destroy communities and kill innocent people. I do want to make sure that all of our children and grandchildren and generations to come, both in the United States and around the globe, have the same opportunity to live well and prosper that I have had. I don't want us all to become poorer as we spend increasing sums of money repairing the damage of climate disruption, damage that could have been prevented at far lower cost. I don't believe it is fair for the profits of a few corporations to become the losses of us all. I believe that government is necessary, but I have no desire to expand it unnecessarily. I also believe, as Pope Francis has stressed, that Earth is our common home, and to disregard climate change is to disregard both nature and justice. As the Pope reminds us, his namesake, St. Francis, was canonized because he, quote, communed with all creation and felt cared to call for all that, to care for all that exists. Some would see such feelings of communion with nature as at odds with cold-hearted scientific rationality. But in the 18th and 19th century, it was a commonplace among European naturalists that scientific investigations were a means to come closer to God. In this, they were following the words of the wisdom of Solomon, 13.5, which tells us, quote, that through the greatness and the beauty of creatures, one comes to know by analogy their maker. Or as Haydn put it in his great oratorio of the late 18th century, the heavens are telling the glory of God, whatever we conceive that glory to be. I also believe that history proves what John Donne wrote nearly 400 years ago, that, quote, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. I believe that I am my brother's keeper, and so are you. Is there not a reason, after all, that in Genesis, the story that follows immediately on the heels of the fall is the story of Cain and Abel? The Old Testament, the foundation of the world's three great monotheistic religions, begins with creation 
and so do the organizing myths and stories of most other human societies. So whether we call it biodiversity or creation or the dream time or Mother Earth, God, climate change threatens it. Everything we know from science, from history, from literature, from ethics, tells us that caring for our fellow citizen and caring for the environment are the same thing. The dichotomy of man versus environment, or jobs versus environment, or prosperity versus environment, is a dangerous fiction constructed to justify greed. It cynically warrants destruction in the name of the false promise profit of progress. That is what I believe. And if we fail to act on our scientific knowledge and it turns out to be right, people will suffer and the world will be diminished. The evidence for this is overwhelming. On the other hand, if we act on the available scientific evidence, the scientific conclusions, and they turn out to be wrong, well, then as the cartoonist says, we will have created a better world for nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Naomi, and we've ended on a humorous note. <laughs> um, so we have two graduate students from the History Science Department who are going to run up and down with microphones um, to enable you to ask questions that everyone else can hear. So Naomi is open for questions, and I do hope <laughs> we have some. Looks like Lauren's got one here. Lauren, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. Uh, just to provoke you a little, <laughs> I confess that I would be happier if the title of your book was not Why Trust Science, but Why Distrust mm. Science's Critics. As historians of science, we all know that if civilization is still around 200 years from now, it's highly probable that scientists will say that all of the scientific theories, or at least most of them, that we possess now, 200 years ago, were incomplete, fallible, or even wrong. So the, the point, I think, might be not how solid science is, but how insubstantial and wrong the arguments of the critics of science today are. Yeah, well that's a great point. And of course, as a historian of science, I've thought about that a lot because no historian of science would ever claim that science is infallible. But I guess the short answer to your question is in a way, what you just said is what Merchants of Doubt is all about, right? I mean, that book was about showing why the critics of climate science were, should not be viewed as credible, because in fact, they were motivated by things that had really nothing to do with the scientific evidence per se. I think the other thing I've, I thought a lot about is, um, I mean, so I was raised in a generation of historians of science for whom fallibilism was kind of the central thing, right? I mean, in graduate school, we were all taught about the pessimistic meta-induction, which was that if you look at the history of science and you see that so many previous theories have been shown to be incomplete, partial, or in some cases, outright wrong, uh, the induction that we would come to from that is that everything we believe now will eventually be shown to be wrong too. But I think now, maybe Larry Loudon and those folks went a little too far. Because even though it's true that we can look back and see ways in which that knowledge was incomplete, we can also see ways in which it still worked effectively for the people who were using it. And you know, we have famous examples in the history of science, right? Like the Ptolemaic system of astronomy that allowed people to accurately predict eclipses, right? I mean, this is a famous example. Or the one that physicists love to defend uh, against the incommensurability thesis, right, which is Newtonian mechanics. So we could say now that in a deep way, Newtonian mechanics is false because we would say now that we recognize that time and space are not absolute. And yet, Newtonian mechanics worked incredibly well for the people who used it. And so in a guess, in a way, I slightly fall back on a pragmatic or utilitarian argument, which is that 
even though we will for sure learn that some of our conceptualization, some of our understandings of our knowledge will definitely change. Nevertheless, that knowledge is still likely to be reliable for the things we need to do now. So therefore, if we need to make decisions about whether or not to vaccinate our children or whether or not to act on climate change, I think we can feel pretty confident saying that if we act on the knowledge we have, well, that's the worst case scenario, right? Uh, we still end up with something that probably will work out pretty well for us. Whereas if we ignore it and don't vaccinate our children, for example, well, we already, we've already seen what that looks like. Hey, uh, what advice do you have for uh, science communicators? I'm specifically interested in uh, people who are writing for children, mm. uh, middle schoolers, high schoolers, or elementary school children, uh, but also artists who are trying to collaborate with scientists to communicate ideas. Yeah. Well, of course, I'm not a science communicator, even though I, I play one on TV, right? <laughs> they often get introduced as that. It's not really what I am. I don't study communication. But I would say if the question is children, you know, I think children are just amazing, right? Children are naturally curious. Children are naturally interested in science. Lots of children, you know, I used to do things where I would bring rocks and minerals to classrooms, and the children were always so into it, right? Um, and then you'd kind of like wonder, like, you'd look at your colleagues and think, what happened? No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, but um, so I don't think there's really a lot of problem about children. I think as long as you engage with children, you get down on the floor with them and you talk and you treat them like the human beings that they are, it's all good. I think the problem comes in kind of later when people start realizing these tensions between scientific findings and what can be perceived to be their social or economic implications. And that's where this argument about values comes in. That I think that because the issue is about the implications, you cannot solve it by simply giving people more scientific facts. And we have a lot of evidence to support that now. But you may be able to solve it if you are willing to actually engage them on the level of the implications and say, well, let's talk about that. Does evolutionary theory mean that life is meaningless? Well, actually, we have lots of evolutionary biologists who have written very eloquent about how they personally find meaning in life in the face of evolutionary theory. And as I said, I, I mean, Ken Miller is exceptionally good on that, but he's not the only one. Uh, Francisco Ayala has written on this, Sir John Houghton. I mean, there are many scientists who are themselves people of faith who are biologists or are evolutionary biologists who have taught quite eloquently on this. And there's research that's been done now in the classroom, particularly at Arizona State, uh, that shows that if you do this, if you actually engage with it and give students readings by scientists who are Christians, or that in many cases for the students, it's like transformative. They're saying, oh, that's fine, great. I can be a Christian and still learn evolutionary biology. So it's really about finding ways to have that conversation, but not to avoid it, which is what in the past many of us have done. Hi. Thank you for the, the excellent talk. I have two questions. Uh, one is that, uh, in a way similar to the communicators of uh, science, but for journalists, that you give the example, for example, of the autism, uh, well, of, of uh, vaccination causing autism. That was a paper that uh, was retracted later, but uh, in, meanwhile, it, may, it created a lot of damage, and in part because the press went crazy about uh, that specific article. Uh, so I understand completely what you say, that if, uh, as, uh, the scientific process has a way of vetting this uh, the paper over time and, and uh, finding that if it replicates or not. But on the, on the other hand, uh, not everybody outside that community understands that a single paper might not be a scientific claim, right? And, and uh, so how do you balance these two, uh, these two things in a way that we, we have to be skeptical of some things, but, uh, but on the other hand, have a foundation, well, believe the foundations of science. Uh, and sorry, the other quick question is uh, more, mostly if you're um, familiar with uh, Philip uh, Tedlock's uh, work on experts. Um, uh, on what? Philip, sorry, it resounds and it's very strange to, <laughs> to speak like the way. Uh, so Philip Tedlock uh, has done scientific uh, uh, studies on experts and the uh, opinion of experts, sometimes the experts' predictions, uh, uh, mostly in, the, in economics and political science and other, that have been uh, very inaccurate <laughs> and very uh, um, many times wrong. And uh, are the super forecasters are the ones that I actually predict a lot better. So it's when it's not only ex experts, uh, um, uh, I guess, 
uh, intuitions or, or, or reviews that are, I know that you talk about it in another context in peer review, but, but uh, uh, when you ask for ex expert opinion on some decisions that have a societal uh, impact, uh, the super forecasters have a much better rate of predicting well than the actual known experts. And those base their, their predictions on data and computation. So I just yeah, wonder. Okay, if you well, uh, yeah, I say those are complicated questions, so I'll just try to answer quickly. On the first one, I think you, you said it yourself. Journalists went crazy. I mean, journalists do something that's incredibly damaging, right, which is they run, you get a single study that's con counterintuitive and journalists run with it, and they don't do their homework. Not, I mean, not all journalists, but and we saw this two weeks ago with the red meat papers, and what was particularly offensive about that was that um, journalists essentially did no homework about who these people were, whether these studies were reliable, but big flat, you know, splash about it. I mean, the journal that published it, there's some issues there too, but it's a complicated issue. But, you know, within 24 hours, it had come out that several of the authors of these papers had close ties to the beef industry. So, you know, and, and ordinary people found this very quickly. Like one of the guys was at Texas A&M where he runs a seminar on the science and culture of barbecue funded by the Texas Beef in Pork. Okay, so this didn't take very long to find, right? So, I mean, journalists could have done a little homework and then instead of rushing with this, oh my God, beef is great, don't worry. No, they could have said, controversial paper published by scientists with links to the beef industry. And that would have been a more factually correct and also more appropriate. Um, so the factually correct story is a better story for people, but it's also a better story. So that, and the second one, um, super complicated thing. I'm not familiar with that particular story, but, if, but um, I think individual expert elicitation is deeply problematic. And I've written about this in a different book, so shameless plug. Um, Earlier last year, I published with several colleagues a book called Discerning Experts, the Practices of Scientific Assessment for Environmental Policy. And that's a deep dive into some of these thorny issues about expertise and how and why experts sometimes make certain kinds of errors. So I recommend that to you if you're interested in diving deeper into that issue. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, you spoke about the collective vetting of ideas as central to, to the book. Um, but if the incentive structure for the scientific community and academic community have changed to reward professors and scientists for volume of publications, not necessarily quality, how do we preserve the integrity of peer review while still allowing for diverse ideas in this new incentive structure? OK, well, those are two different questions, right? In the Integrity of the peer review process relies on editors and reviewers to take it seriously and to care about it. So, um, yeah, that's, a, that's an, again, another big question that I think, I think journal editors, scientific societies need to take on board. Um, I do think that there's real work that needs to be done. Obviously, if we expect people to trust science, we have to keep our own house in order, and I think there are definitely areas where we have not done that. So I would look to the scientific societies and the journal editors to address that. In terms of the pressure to publish quickly, I mean, you know, this has been, we've been talking about this for a long time, right? And we've, there've been all kinds of proposals that when people come up for tenure, they should only be allowed to submit X number of papers, or if you apply to NSF, you're only allowed to put you know, five most relevant plus five more papers on it. These things don't seem to have really solved the problem. So I, again, I think, I think it is a real issue. I don't think Krosnick is wrong about some of the perverse incentives in science, and I think we do have to address them. But at the same time, I think the main casualty of excessive publication, as far as I can tell, is just an incredible waste of time, actually, because thousands and thousands of scientists are publishing papers that no one reads. So that's not really a good use of human resources, but whether it damages science as a knowledge producing activity is sort of a different question. So I think it's wasteful when people are rushing to publish and publishing a lot of stuff that's not that well thought out. Whether it really does a lot of damage, though, I think the evidence is unclear on that. So we have time for one more question. Gilly, have you someone up there? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, I have two, and I'm struggling to figure out which one to go. Well, I guess... You can ask them both, and I can choose one. <laughs> oh, that's great. That was what I was going to suggest. So the first one would be, um, why would the title... Uh, okay, so why the title 
why trust science as opposed to why trust scientists mm. and the difficulty of having science be this block term that you could almost replace kind of with God, right? Just kind of this vague notion. And then the second one is, um, you know, you cited this example of relation of these authors to the beef industry. And I think, you know, that, that really resonates with me in, in, a, in a coupling with your first example that you gave of, you know, you know, why should I trust you? Which is, you know, your values or you have something about your past that would cause me to distrust. So how do we um, intelligently sift the things that are genuine doubts, like a link to the beef industry, versus something that's more nebulous, such as someone's religious disposition? Yeah, that's a great question. In a way, those are two sides of the same coin, so I'll treat them as one question actually connected back here. Um, so I do think, following up from the previous question, scientific journals have to be a lot stricter about their vetting processes. And one thing that happened in this last uh, case was that the Annals of Internal Medicine, which published these papers, it was a set of published, um, they said that these people did not violate their disclosure policy. And it turned out the reason for this was because their disclosure policy was you only had to disclose funding, direct funding from industry within the last three years. So that's bad on a lot of levels because you could have all kinds of relationships with industry that don't fall into the category of, quote, direct funding. And then also the three-year thing is ridiculous. I mean, that would be like me saying, I have no relation to my ex-husband because we've been divorced for five years, right? I mean, it's just not a long enough period of time. And then the annals also said that they relied on the honesty of authors, that this is essentially an honor system and that they don't have the capacity to vet people's claims on the disclosure. Well, I understand that. I think it is true that journal editors don't really have the time to be checking on every author, but there's also no consequence in this model if a person lies, which it turns out arguably some of these people did, depending on how you interpret it. So I think that if it comes out after the fact that a scientist did not follow the disclosure, well, let me first of all say, I think the disclosure policies have to be stricter, they have to be cleaner and clearer, and not, they have to have a much longer statute of limitations than three years. But also, if it's found that someone violated them, I believe the paper has to be retracted. Because otherwise, the policy has no bite. Right? If there's no consequence for not disclosing, then, then, what, then so what? So I think journals have to clean up their act and be much stricter. But I do want to answer your first question, because that was actually the original title of the book, Why Trust Scientists. Actually, it was, why should we trust scientists? And if any of you have seen my TED Talk, that is the title of my TED Talk. But in doing this work, my thinking about this actually evolved, which is a good thing, um, because I came to realize it's not about trusting individual scientists. I actually don't think we should trust individual scientists because they may be biased. They may be taking money from you know, some industry with a vested interest. They may have a blind spot. But if we believe that this process is operating as it should, that peer review is operating in a rigorous way, that the community is diverse, that people are really looking hard at the data and asking tough questions, then even if an individual science is biased, the net result over time should be pretty good. And in fact, I would argue that as bad as this red meat thing was a couple weeks ago, and if you haven't looked into this, you should, because it's, it's a pretty conspicuous example. Within 48 hours, there were all kinds of people saying that these papers were wrong, including a number of our colleagues here at Harvard, including several who issued some really nice um, posts. There were a couple of good posts in the Harvard Gazette, I think it was, explaining why these papers were fallacious, exposing the links to the beef industry. So very quickly, people got onto this issue and exposed the errors that had taken place. And I think that actually supports my argument, right? So there, this guy from Texas A&M, no, I don't think we should trust him. I think he's got a giant conflict of interest. And if he wants to eat barbecue because he likes it, God bless him. But don't tell the rest of us that it's good for us because we know it's not. I mean, if you do it once a year, that's fine. But right, you shouldn't be eating a lot of barbecue, right? Um, so I don't think we should trust him as an individual. But I think that the process as a whole worked pretty well because within 48 hours, all kinds of people were saying, actually, we have a lot of really good evidence that eating a lot of red meat is bad, it gives you cardiovascular disease, causes colon cancer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of good information, in fact, came out pretty quickly in this case. And that 
it's probably a good place to stop. So we are, thank you. We are going to end this part of the proceedings and move across the hallway to Cabot Library for a reception and the opportunity to buy Naomi's book, have more, talk more with her, ask her questions over there. And now I'd like to thank Naomi Oreskes very much. Thank you.